Hey, and welcome to Varn Blog, and this is a Varn Blog Ramble. And I think that's how I'm going to brand these things, because rant seems a very shock jock radio-ish, and while I am ranty um, when written out, when you actually hear me speak, I actually am much more measured, and that's just the way I am. That's actually one of the reasons I got into podcasting in the first place. People would read my commentary on Facebook or on live journal that's how far back this goes um and think i was foaming at the mouth and then when they would hear me explain the exact same thing they would back down and realize that it was a reason perspective and i'm actually going to do you know if you've been one of my fans i brought this particular topic up before although maybe not in as detailed as i'm going to talk about it today i want to talk about privilege now, unfortunately, the discourse, as trademarked by whoever talks about the discourse, be it, you know, some blogger or Habermas, um, talks a lot about privilege. And it's really something that feels very 90s to me um, and continued in our frameworks and became ubiquitous in the last decade. Um Kind of like uh, the cancel culture wars totally recapitulates three rounds of PC culture wars. Um, the privilege thing has been around for a while. Now, the cancel culture wars and the privilege discussion are all epiphenomena of the way we down drill cultural media. But privilege is interesting. Because... Both the people complaining about privilege and the people who are defending it are often not good faith actors, actually, in the, in the first place, and in, 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 both, in both scenarios, and um, are often completely missing the point. So, when people say privilege is real, I tend to agree with them in so much that the thing we call X privilege usually is about five different things, 10 different things, 20 different things that manifest in the way people experience life in a very real way. When people say privilege is a myth, they're often conflating that privilege has no explanatory power. And that's something that people who think privilege is real often get wrong. They think that privilege is an explanation for the kinds of systemic biases which privilege actually describes, and it's really just a metaphor for it. If you go back to um, privilege, you can kind of trace this thought to late, you know, classical um, black communist figures talking about, you know, the wages of whiteness, or white skin privilege, which is how Nola Nivea translated that from E.B. Du Bois. Now, these were cultural norms and systemic things that, and I see even that's vague, systemic uh, things that really um, made even dealing with class, even within the class, hard to talk about. So you took two people who had the same, or in the same economic class, but were different races, and you would see that one had systemic advantages over the other. Then in the, I believe the late 80s, Peggy McClintock was trying to get a bunch of well-meaning pedagogues to understand these systemic differences, and she came up with the invisible knapsack. Now, there's been critiques of the invisible knapsack, some of which I would even echo. Some of the things she says are racial privilege are actually not just unique to race. Um, but this was used as an as an explanation, why is there systemic differences and cultural differences? Because people have privilege. And in fact, in the late in the late 90s and in the aughts, you even sometimes have the formulation of power plus privilege equals racism, which interestingly had no mention of race in the definition. Um, 
Now, people like Abraham X. Kendi, um, some, even some critical race theorists have actually rejected this because it's too simplistic and because it doesn't weirdly mention race in the definition itself. Um, but it, it attributes to the metaphor for why there is systemic. I mean, let me rephrase that. It attributes to the metaphor for that there is systemic disadvantage to why there is systemic disadvantage. All right. When we talk about racism, bigotry, habitus, structural wealth inequity, and implicit bias, plus things that are even uncomfortably may be descriptively true, but are caused by poverty, um, by systemic unaccess. Um, systemic unaccess is a weird way of saying things, right? But all this is across the board, and it's not unique to race. But let me let me talk about just a racial example. Somebody asked me, I had a liberal said, well, how would you as a class first Marxist? And I'm like, I'm, I don't even know what that means. That's some weird uh, way of phrasing somebody who focuses on class issues the most. Um, deal with, you know, the fact you can't explain why there's a glass floor for for white people um, and not for black people. And I said, look, I can't actually explain it. One, it's white people in aggregate. Um, so not dealing with even bracketing out um, implicit bias, which is a psychological trait that has a cultural norm, and even bracketing out explicit bigotry. Let's say you just magically made those two things go away. People in this country who have been here for, let's say, five, six, seven generations and who came here with wealth, even without wealth, they were just granted land by, you know, um, whatever, have now had five, six, seven generations of wealth accumulation, passing down parts of inheritance, etc. And most people have had three. Compare that to, say, most black families where there, have, there is a black bourgeois who has generational wealth that it can pass down. Um, but in the main, most of the money is new and it's income based. So even if you compare two people who have the same income, there's a glass floor on, of the generational wealth because they have inheritance. Factor in that slavery takes a bunch of labor out and... You go get any benefit from that. And then Jim Crow limits any benefits accumulated too. And then you have informal ownership. Even if you had everything equal and you have proportional representation amongst the elites, you would still have systemic racism without even any racist. Okay, so that's how economically propelled systemic racism works. But there are other forms of racism. There are other things that include it that do this with privilege. Um, that's a class-based one. There's also a habitat-based one. So like where people have accumulated redlining, um, private redlining versus public redlining. And the, the, what, it was, what do I mean by that? Well, formally enforced by law or stuff that wasn't actually imposed by the market. Um, how did they create habitats? What jobs are available for people? Why were people more to be in gray and black market area, uh, economy where they might can accumulate income and maybe even some real wealth but since they can't invest in anything because it's not tracked what can you do with it um with immigrants why you know why is the limitations of public you know of jobs because they don't speak english easily etc lead them to go into petit bourgeois that can actually petit bourgeois small business you know why are there so many bodega and uh uh taco truck owners and all that the these are stereotypes, but there's a mild truth to them. And that has to do with like the kinds of things that the cultural allowance, I mean, the, the culture would allow for, right? That's another thing that explains privileges, all right? Um, but it's also true that, it, that when you look at white people and you divide them up by class, um, the privileges are not equal. It's not to say they don't exist, but to talk about privilege as this equal thing that one racial group has equally across the board, that 
it's not entirely true. There's some kinds of things that go into what we call privilege um, that that people would have regardless of their, you know, cultural assumptions, um, implicit implicit bias benefits, all right? But there are also things that if you were generationally poor and white, you also don't have, which is lots of wealth. You don't have a glass floor either, okay? But if there's enough people who do in your group and you're just looking at statistics and aggregate, that gets washed away. So you have people cite statistics as in, for this, that, or the other, and without any explanatory statistics, you know, with any counter methods um, of parsing those out or doing like to like, it looks like, oh, this whole group has this benefit where it's probably not actually true when you look at the fine print. Conversely, conservatives do this with crime stats. All right. You know, they'll talk about, well, you know, X is committing more crimes when then liberals will go, well, there's more police in those neighborhoods. They're monitoring things more. They're more likely to get arrested for smaller crimes. That's all true. See, but you notice where the nuance comes in is where you want it to go, right? Nuance becomes a weapon that you can instrumentalize when talking about this privilege in our normal, liberal, rad liberal, conservative, and racialist discourses. All right. You notice I had about four that are basically on a spectrum. Right. And I'm not saying the center spectrum is actually the good one either. Well, that's true for a lot of different things. We talk about race the most. It's true for sections of a class. All right. This is where stuff like when I talk about habitats, blue collar versus white color, even though they're both part of the same social class as far as their relations to the circuit of production go. Um, you have you have groups that are systemically historically uh have massive bias against them but are because of them actually because of prior limitations of immigration and who's allowed to come over tend to be not wealthy when they even get here or have systemic educational advantages this is recent asian immigrants who um, statistically are actually the most likely people to be attacked by someone outside of their race it's like them and uh other model minorities like Jews. Um, although Jews are now classified as white, so that doesn't show up in the stats um, until you parse it very closely. So, you know, so you have there, you have one kind of mechanism that we might describe as privilege, which is uh, because of, actually because of, you know, racialized, history of racialized immigration laws, that only certain people could come could come here anyway. And so those people tended to be richer when they got here versus a, another kind of systemic privilege or lack of it, which is cultural assumptions, cultural hostilities, um, et cetera. And these also change, not just within, you know, different cultures or whatever, like white privilege works completely differently in Mexico, even though it's also a settler colonial state. Um, but it also changes within um areas of the same country all right why am i talking about this well i was thinking about the way in which we talk about this stuff in black and white ways and where this thing this thing called that we like to call privilege and we use it to explain why there are all these differences it's actually a mystification and you can use it to way turn anti-racism into something about like your own personal feelings you know, like, I check my privilege, I'm exploring myself. Well, th this should not be an internal voyage of discovery, all right? Um, sure, that's interesting. It might make you a less biased and bigoted person. It might it might make you less given towards um, passive aggressive or ignorant comments that we might call microaggressions I'm, um, and stuff like that. But it also makes it you don't deal with the things that are that are actually prompting a lot of the more important elements of the systemic disadvantages. And this, like I said, it's not it's on race, class, gender, religion, um, all kinds of stuff plays into that. And this also gets to complaints about like intersectionality. Like you'll hear Marxists say intersectionality is a bad framework, and then I, you know, and if you, you know, are Intersectionality is this. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw's initial legal work uh, before it was, before 
um, Foucauldian and standpoint epistemology and these various different ideas are incorporated within, even by Crenshaw herself, um, was mostly just looking at the way, like, you might be discriminated against not for being black and not for being a woman, but specifically for being a black woman in a specific workplace. Um, because, uh, you know, that's the intersection. Now, that's just a way of looking at these different systems and seeing where hotspots are. All right. Um, so, you know, and it doesn't and it doesn't have to be based on like simple, obvious identity categories. We always talk about like gender, race, sexuality, etc. There could be other factors. What's the section of, you know, what's the section of the region you're from, the religion you're in, and the job you specifically do that might cause these specific blind spots? Now, on uh, Theorize My Hammer over at Zero Books, I've been talking about, you know, class four itself and in itself. Uh, in itself. I've been talking about Weberian and Badurian notions of class. Um, but there, you can disaggregate this without incorporating, like, Mott and Bailey theories like standpoint epistemology, which in its weak form is transparently true and in a strong form is nonsense. And I know that maybe, you know, some people want to get mad at me, but... Yes, and you are always, your knowledge is always from a perspective of which there are several systems of which there is. That's, that's, a, tr that's a transparently true statement that you could even probably get ancient philosophers to grok. Um, but there is uh, no way in which it's true that I am uniquely more likely to be right because of my experience of a certain qualia that confuses quali qualitative experience with just the objective world. Just like, well, there's no way to get to the objective world. Yeah, but to, to saying that you have absolute knowledge of the objective world um, is different than saying that you just because your your qualitative experience is valid that you would have knowledge of the objective conditions. There's no one does not lead to the other. So the weak form of standpoint makes sense. The strong form of standpoint. Makes no sense. And that's a Mont and Bailey. Like, you, people go back and forth between it. Most people who do Mont and Bailey Texas don't even know they're doing it. All right? Yes, there are some b severely bad faith actors, and, and I mentioned it very in the beginning, but most people do it because, like, talk to a religious person about God. They're going to Mont and Bailey God, whether or not, you know, you can be omniscient and are powerful at the same time. Can, can God create a rock that he cannot lift? You know, omniscience in that way doesn't work. Um, it's actually a very old, like, it, you know, it's a very old dilemma. Um, so, you know, you, you people, when the people talk about God are, are um, another example is the Euphrophro dilemma classically from Plato. Is something good because the gods do it or the gods do it because they're good? All right. People will go back and forth between those two without even thinking about it. And they're not even meaning to. All right. It is kind of just the way we we concepts in our heads that are closely related, but not really the same. And privilege, even though it might be useful for getting people to understand that these systemic biases exist, the moment you make an explanation for those biases, structural inequities and bigotry, the moment you make it the explanation for all three of those things, it actually doesn't explain anything because it's describing those things in a word as a metaphor that gets you to think about it. Like, you know, privilege comes from like, I have a special privilege because of X status. You know, think about like um, the privileges of medieval lords or the privileges of being in the church. Well, some of these things are not th granted to you, especially even socially. They're things that even if we had relative social equality, which we don't have, um, would still be a problem. And trying to explain them with privilege just ends up like, okay, you have white privilege. Why do I have white privilege? Because you're white, All right? Now, that's a very simplified way of viewing things. And most people kind of know that privilege is more than that. But when we throw those words around like that, eventually that's what it becomes, and people can easily reject that too. So you actually give the other bad faith actors on the other side something to deal with. 
I tend not to use the word because also now there's this this other thing that comes up this using this word picks a battle in a culture war. Um, kind of like what I talked about, the PC cancel culture wars. The cancel culture wars is just a rebranding of the PC wars, which are itself, you know, came up in the 90s um, and in the 80s. Like Dinesh D'Souza, you know, was doing, was was talking about this in the 80s, you know, in the 90s with, you know, history professors. Um, and then you had the counter signaling and counter thing going on. Um, in the same way, I've been alive long enough to see this happen three different times, and it just gets slightly rebranded. We've had 30 years of people talking about political correctness. It no longer has the sting. It's nullified on both sides. So canceling, you know, which has a history in actually in people complaining. I mean, the history of canceling was it was a, a left wing word about complaining about people canceling out other people's complaints. Um, within the left sphere, and it expanded to people, you know, social ostracizing it. Um, seven, eight years ago, we were having the the debate over call-out culture. It's the exact same debate, all right? Um, and before that, again, PC culture round two, and if you go back to when I was a teenager, probably PC culture round 1.5, you know, it probably goes all the way back to the 70s. Although I, I think the term politically correct was not used massively um, until the 80s. So it's an old battle that fits into a media narrative that effectively reinforces both sides. This is, again, that mutually constitutive death spiral thing. Um, so there's three different things we have to deal with here. One, privilege was useful as a metaphor to describe the systemic things, but it, two, it doesn't actually, it can't be a cause because it's a description. And it's a description that people can easily understand, but when you use the, it as a cause to explain the, defect, the effects it describes, it completely falls apart logically. Three, now it's almost a tainted term because of associations in the cultural world in which people will just blanket it out. And four, it's also associated with various other theories that can be used with, in a mont belly. So even if you think it's real, it may not be tactically smart to talk that way anymore, all right? Um, and so, you know, I want to get, I want to get us out of thinking in these ways that are purely reactive, all right? We might even say that inherently reactionary, not because they're politically reactionary or far right, but because they put you in just reacting to the other side. And that's what this mutually constitutive death spiral that I started this series off with is about. You're just reacting, right? You're reacting to the, to the impulses of your opposition, which also means that you two define each other. You are mutually defining. You just, be, it becomes like a mirror image discourse dance. If you want to break out of that, you have to look at what causes it, how it develops in time, how something as innocent as a pedagogical metaphor. Peggy McClintock was a teacher of teachers. She was a, um, an education professor or is an education professor. I can't remember if she's still if she's retired or not, but it expands. All right, then it gets hooked up to other discourses, intersectionality, legal, uh, critical race theory in terms specifically of law from Kimberly Crenshaw. That gets expanded to general social theory, and that gets expanded into internet parlance. And then all of a sudden, we're throwing these words around, and we don't even really know what they mean. Like if you ask people who are responding positively or negatively to intersectional. Um, usually they're not responding to the history of the term at all. All right, that's all I have to say on all that today. I am really busy here. Um, as another thing I want you guys to talk about is, do you like these videos and would you like them as a podcast feed separately from this? I'm not going to edit them. I don't have time. I have too much going on, so know that ahead of time. What I would do is maybe just rip these audio out of the videos and throw them up on a Libsyn feed. Um, and note that that has a cost. And I'm trying to provide this stuff to you guys for free. Um, hence me not investing a lot of money in it. Um, so tell me if you're interested in that. If you're not, great. Um, like and subscribe. We have a guest on Wednesday. Varn Vlogs on Wednesday are going to be discussions. I, I, they're not really interviews because it's real loose back and forth. 
like my interview style is very different than my discussion style and i probably talk as much as my host so it's just two people sitting together blogging heads you know um so do that um i should be coming back to uh pop the left relatively soon esri uh over at emancipation network will have some new uh mortal science for you and blog blog i'm gonna try to do these at least twice a week one discussion one video like this um sometimes i'll do more lately it's also the end of the quarter at my day job and um i'm personally having to uh deal with some stuff um you know um, um at home which is part of why i was taking hiatus in the first place so um i'm not using these to just scream to the world as much but if you're interested um like and subscribe share them do me a favor uh tell people about it um i'm not making money off this yet and i'm probably never i'm going to try to keep them at least publicly available for free um so that's just me rambling